Okay, one minute countdown here. Let's get everybody in their spaces, please. One minute countdown. Find your seats. 45 seconds, everybody. 45 seconds. Find your seats. Thirty seconds left to find your seats. Thirty seconds left to find your seats. Fifteen seconds. Ten, nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. Welcome back from lunch. Hi, everybody. All right, we're going to go into our second of three listening circles. We just had one with the creators and, and guests. Those of us who aren't creators. And, uh, which is ridiculous. Um, and, and now we're moving into the conversation with interpreters, which is defined as directors, designers, artists, and actors, interpreters. Before we start, and I welcome folks up here, um, just want to mention, we've gotten some good feedback about um, how things are flowing, and we're going to be making slight transition, tra slight changes based on your responses. So what we're going to do is we're going to actually trim the two next listening circles a bit in time, They'll be a bit shorter than they were this than it was this morning before lunch, and we're going to add more time to the next conocimiento group. So when you go back into your circles with the folks you met this morning, that's going to be a larger amount of time because we just heard there's a lot of juicy stuff happening in those groups, and we want to give you more time to to do so. Um, an invitation, I just wanted to repeat the invitation. We're gonna start with a group of folks in the center with our moderator, Karen Zacarias. And, uh, and, then, uh, and then please, please feel free when, when, when Karen opens it up to come in, to say, to flow out. Folks who start out in the beginning um, please feel free, once Karen's open it up, make some space for folks. So we have a real sense of flow, so people have a chance to come in and speak their mind. A lot of us are, are interpreters, a lot of us work with interpreters in the room. And so, um, just opening up that invitation to you. All right, let's get started. Uh, so, Karen Zacarias, right on. Thank you. I'd like to invite Misha Espinosa. Misha. Maika. Oh, pero qué? La micha. Okay, Maika. Fancy. Eh, Sa Sa Sandra Delgado. Thank you, Sandra. Christopher Asivo. Bienvenido. Thank you. Irma Mayorga. Regina Garcia. Jerry Ruiz. Jose Carasquillo, Lori Woolery, yes. <laughs> Mark David Pinate, and Daniel Jaquez, come on down! <laughs> oh, and Juliet Carrillo. I would like to know what's the one thing you never want to hear again. 
in the American theater, and how, how would you go about that? Anybody? Is there a question there? One phrase, explanation. You never <laughs> I never want to hear another critic compare a Latino play to a telenovela. Yeah. And how would you, how, would, how should we resolve that? Um, educating our critics. <laughs> you know, I don't, I don't know. I mean, it's, it's just racism. It's prejudice. It's, it's ridiculous. I had, I had no idea that middle-aged white critics were so well-versed in the genre of telenovela. <laughs> <that they were. laughs> yeah, I don't know. Maybe someone else has an idea. Latino critics. Latino critics, thank you. Thank you. Scholars, scholars, we want you, we need you. Anybody else, a phrase or an explanation used that you just don't want to hear again? Uh, that there's not enough uh, Latino talent yes. out there. Yeah. Yeah. And so how do you want to resolve it? By producing our work and um, by uh, encouraging them to look deeper mm -hmm. and writing roles and hiring our own people to tell those stories. Anybody else in the circle? I'll take um, I really like this question, and I have so many, but I'm only going to say one that uh, I hear again and again, playwright. Me, well, I don't think he's right. Them, well, I know he or she is not Latino, but he or she is really good as an actor. Anybody else? The one Latino in the production of Romeo and Juliet. Could you add some Spanish? Could you could you spice it up? Yeah. Anybody out there in the sea of listeners that there's a phrase you just never want to hear again? There's just not a big enough audience for a Mexican American play. Could you, be more, could you be more urban? <laughs> sure, it's great, but could you add more men to this? <laughs> Anything else? Get it out, let's get it out. That's not a Latino play. Why? It's not about Latinos, or it's not about, or it's not a Latino play. Hmm. A fiery, hot chili pepper timing. <laughs> English speaking audiences will feel left out. <laughs> 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 so, just one critic in particular uh, came to see our last play and obviously didn't know anything about the community and said, uh, like, Urban Theater com Company performing in the impoverished Humble Park, which was like, you know, where are you from? Because you don't know what's going on in the community, basically. So, do your research before you go on write crap. <laughs> <laughs> One last round. Oh, whoa, go, uh, There are Latino directors who can direct at the Lord level. Mm. Yeah. <coughs> that actor just doesn't look Latino. Mm. <laughs> yeah, go ahead. I, oh, this is what I've heard many times that I, Latino actors, especially a couple years ago, they were saying they just don't have the training to play Hamlet. We can't give it to them yet. They're not ready for that. To be or not to be? Yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry. Yeah. This yeah. comes from our audiences and it comes from every round. You know what you should do? <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Oh, well, there we go. Can 
you do that with an accent? Uh -oh. <laughs> uh, this is mine. You look so American. <laughs> Assuming America looks what certain way? So. Okay, very good. Thank you very much. So throw you from that, from the phrases we just anybody else in here in the structure? Jared? I'm good. I'm good. No. Yeah. Um I heard this. Um, I saw the play in the season, that Latino play in the season, and I was really concerned. But I came to see the play and I loved it. <laughs> um, it's from a, a, a wife of a very high up executive in a very high up theater. <laughs> Jerry, anybody else? Oh, the guy, get it out. Uh, from a foundation, uh, but we already gave Steppenwolf and Goodman to do their Latino play. Mm -hmm. yeah. 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 Well, <laughs> Designer side, yes. we're not doing a Latino play this year. Yeah, it has nothing to do with Latino, but it's how they keep us out because they go, if you're good enough, we'll hear about you. Oh. And you go, well, uh, what's that? I don't know what good enough is. Mm -hmm. So you master your craft, well, what's that? They, so they don't become specific. They just make it a track, and that's how you get smooth a lot of time. So obviously we have some obstacles out there. So let me ask you this. What was some of the best advice anyone ever gave you in your career? Something that you'd like to share with us today. Yay. Um, hi, I'm Jose. Uh, there is a woman who founded a theater in Washington, D.C. A lot of you know her. Her name is Joy Zimmerman. Um, I, in 19... I think in the late 70s, I, I was told to go there that she could uh, kind of help me. And uh, I just had a great conversation with her. And eventually, I took a directing class with her. And uh, I remember the night of my final project there, because it really made me who I am today. She basically told me, listen, <laughs> there's nothing wrong with you. You're just a theater director. <laughs> um, and, she said, I really don't give a shit about that. What I care about is what are you going to do to make that happen? Um, and I have spent the last 33 years of my life doing exactly that. So that was the best because somebody recognized uh, why I could never sit still in a room, <laughs> why I always had to kind of uh, determine how are we going to tell a story in this room, um, how are we going to do it, who's going to speak, who's going to project. Who's going to make an entrance? Um, who's going to cry? Who's not? Um, so, so that was really the best, and she's been my guiding light and force ever since. Um, so, yeah. Best advice. <clears throat> this is uh, some advice that I got from from Octavio uh, about uh, a few months before I went to start my graduate program. Um, he was helping us work on uh, on this new script we were working on, and we were. We had been playing around for a, a couple years with uh, mixing ceremonia with, with theater performance. And um, we were doing that in this play, and you know, Octavio was like, you know, you really should keep, keep at that, you know, keep trying to bring in indigenous spirituality into the work that you're doing and mixing those two, because it's, it's not a lot of people doing that right now. Um, and um, I took that and I just really made that like, the thing I was going to investigate all through my three years of graduate school, and um, it, it was very, very helpful. If, I don't think if he had said that, I wouldn't have kept pursuing that. So, thank you. That would be all right. Thank you. Okay, so thank you. Um, this was advice that was given to me, and the person doesn't realize that they gave me this life-changing advice. Um, I was doing Karen's. Mariela in the desert at the Goodman. And I was at a point in my life where I wasn't sure if I could be a mother and still be an artist. And Karen walked in there, first day of rehearsal, with her young toddler. I was breastfeeding. 
Yes, yes, you were breastfeeding. <laughs> um, she walked in with a toddler and a newborn. And we all sat around the table and did our table read and had a discussion. And she had her baby the whole time. And it was so incredibly inspiring. And I felt like that question was answered for me in that moment that I could, that I could do it. And now I have a six-year-old. <laughs> And I'm here. I was a starving actor in New York City, and there was a free talk um, about Latinos in theater given by Raul Julia. And I went there, and I went up to him afterwards, all starstruck. <laughs> what do I do? And um, I wrote it down. Okay. Yeah, he said, um, he said, get training. He said, go to the best place you can go and get training, dive in, take pride in your culture, and don't be afraid to learn about it. Uh, hi, I'm Jerry. Uh, a few years ago, I was uh, in a collaboration class uh, at the public uh, that Oscar Eustace was teaching. And, uh, and sort of, you know, by way of one of his very colorful stories, um, he, he told us, uh, life in the theater is too hard to do it by yourself. You cannot do this alone. You won't. You'll go crazy, basically, is, is what he said. And, and I really uh, took that to heart because, um, you know, I feel like, you know, in the early part of, of my career starting out, I really was trying to, to do it on my own. And it was really only when I found my, my community, my uh, you know, my circle of close collaborators that I was able to start kind of uh, doing the work that, that I wanted to do and, and the way I wanted to do it. Um, and really, I think it, it just, I mean, it's so obvious. You can't do theater alone. You, you need other people. And uh, there was just something about that that made me realize I had to, I had to open up. I had to, I had to let other people in uh, and trust and risk and, uh, you know, have that, have that, uh, have that community, really. Um, one of my early mentors uh, is Jose Cruz Gonzalez, and um, he, I feel, was kind of the first person who saw me uh, with the name Lori Woolery. It gets confusing, and looking the way I do, and uh, not being owned by either side, he said, embrace your hybridity and um, you straddle the cracks and that's your power, so work from there. Um, Daniel Hakis. Um, equality uh, isn't justice. You know, I learned that from the very beginning, how to focus my work and what I wanted to do. And just recently, I started seeing some sort of posting somewhere about... Alex Beach. Uh, Alex Beach had it. And it kind of, uh, I'll describe it a little bit. Uh, there were three uh, three kids looking over a, a fence, a uh, baseball fence, and there were different sizes, and there were three equal sized boxes. So equality meant that everybody got a box and everybody stood on the box. But because the kids were in different sizes, they could some could not see still. So and then justice is the next picture, I think, where uh, the tallest kid gives the box to the shortest kid, and now all three can see. So uh, when I saw that, it kind of threw me back at uh, when I started all of this as an activista in La Unam, you know, a long, long, long time ago, and why I wanted to do this and reach out to the, the communities that I do. Quality is not justice. <laughs> Hi, my name is Regina Garcia. I um, studied uh, painting when I was in college. Um, a, when I graduated, Pregones Theater was the only theater that answered my letter and uh, said, come over, we need ushers, and get involved in whichever way you can. And I love that, because they were the only ones that replied, out of 22, pregones replied. So I started ushering for them, then so a year and a half later, they gave me an opportunity to design, which I put up there in the timeline. And, uh, but after, um, I think it was four or five years, um, Alvan Colon Lespierre, the production manager, um, and one of the directors said, uh, let's, let's have a drink, we met Midtown. And he said, uh, I used to, actually, I just want you to know that I used to take very long lunches up to the Bronx 
to be able to help set up productions and all that, because I used to work in advertising at the time mm -hmm. in the city. And uh, so I used to take three, four hour lunches. And it was, I mean, my boss was very supportive because I used to work very hard and that was fine. And so I met Alvan one evening and he said, you know, I think it's time for this not to be a hobby anymore. It's not another job. This is going to be a life. Mm. And um, I think it's, it's time to go to school. So uh, I applied to grad school, and that's how it all changed. Yeah. But it's not a hobby, not a job. It's a life. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> um, I'm Juliet Carrillo. Uh, so uh, this is something that I read. It's Maria, Maria Irene Fornes. Um, she says, uh, the life in the theater doesn't pay enough, uh, and it's too hard. So only take projects that challenge you to learn something new about yourself. Um. Anybody out there have a piece of advice they really want to give the room? Yes. Yes, when I was a, a young writer, and I used to talk about all these great things I was going to do, somebody over a few drinks told me, a writer writes a bullshitter talks about writing, mm -hmm. and then asks me which one was I. <laughs> <laughs> this is the advice that changed my life. While I was uh, in my PhD in Munich, New York, I had a European Center professor who told me after he read one of my papers, you will never make it, change your profession. And I always remember that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, I'd like to honor Jose Cruz Gonzalez because as an academic at UC Irvine at the time in the 80s, uh, he got me out of academia and said, come on back and look at theater from theater. So I would not be a casa me tonta. <laughs> and the other person was Irene. And I didn't get to do the, the lab uh, workshop. That wasn't my thing. I was proud of But she did a workshop at UCLA. And Actually, I got permission to be more than a scholar from these two people. I got permission from Jose to really be in theater and from Irene to write uh, creatively and not just be stuck in the scholar editor. So it's cool to be more than just one thing. And most of us are many things. Yes. Uh, when I was young, probably <coughs> late teens, I was talking to my dad, saying, you know, I'm not sure what I want to do with my life. And my dad said, you should, you know, you should do something that you love because <coughs> people are difficult to work with. And wherever you go, there's going to be politics and there's going to be stuff going on. So no matter what you decide to do, just make sure you love it. So a couple of years later, when I told him I wanted to be a theater artist, I could see on the look, the look on his face, <laughs> oh, God, anybody but that. <laughs> one, but I wish I'd heard it a long time ago, uh, that stop trying to impress the people who don't get it, who don't understand you, and, and just focus on the people who do get it, who do understand you. Yes. Um, I, I'd like to thank uh, Don Luis for this, uh, this statement that really helped me. The time, our, our Teatro Vision was going through a very, very difficult time. We didn't know we were going to and he said, everything has its life cycle. Everything, you know, that's life. You know, that's life. And, and I just kind of like, you know, I didn't feel like a personal failure or, you know, it's just, oh, there's a lifespan, you know, and a life cycle to what we do. And lo and behold, uh, we're reborn in a very exciting form. So, thank you. <laughs> that at a time when I was lamenting the path my career was taking, it seemed to be spiraling downward. <laughs> uh, I, had, uh, I was crying in my beer with Mark Lemos and, uh, and saying, where's my career going to? I, gotta, I don't know what to do with my career. And he said, uh, don't worry about your career. Your career is what you've done already. Just do your work. <laughs> Just focus on work. On a similar uh, experience, I was in D.C. having coffee with a certain 
playwright from Mexico. That, that's me, Karen. Okay, yes. And I was going. Uh, I was going through this. She might not remember this, but it, it made a big impact on me. I was going through my lows as well, and she listens very carefully, very attentively, and all she says, "Oh, Picasso had a blue period." <laughs> I'm a storyteller. <laughs> That's the reason why I have to tell the stories that, that touch my heart. Um, I have a little story for all of you. Uh, you know, for 20 years, I wanted to do a play by Arthur Miller called After the Fall. Uh, when I first read it, uh, which was <laughs> pretty much out of high school, I, I was just so blown away by what this man had done. I thought the play was actually unproducible. Uh, it was so kind of experimental. It happened all in someone's head. Um, and for 20 years, in every city that I went, I tried to convince some of the regional theaters to let me do this. And um, I knew that they were passing judgment. It's like, you're not an American director. You're not, you know, there's no way you could do an Arthur Miller play. Um, uh, interestingly enough, I had the good fortune that two years ago at a place, very crazy place in DC called Theater J, Somebody by the name of Ari Roth um, said, uh, you know, you have so much passion for this, you live with it for 20 something years, do it. Um, and um, I go one step further, uh, the woman who played Maggie was actually a Latina. Um, and that was quite unbelievable that a theater, that I found a theater that could support this vision. Uh, I think Gabriela Fernandez Coffee is an astonishing actor and you all will hear about her. Uh, as her career progresses. Um, and furthermore, it was really amazing because I've heard some of the things that we hate hearing. It's like, well, she's Latina, she can't play Marilyn Monroe. And I'm like, uh, <laughs> this play is not about Marilyn Monroe. This play is about a character named Maggie and, and Gabby can actually do it. Well, we should put her on a blonde wig. Why? <laughs> she's gonna play it from the heart. Let us see what she can do. And I tell you, um, the, the, the people who saw that play to this day in DC walk into the street and tell me they've never seen a production of this play done this way, including some of the uh, people that worked on it originally with Arthur Miller on Broadway. Uh, Gabby was magnificent and the show was great. And you know, we as artists just need to keep knocking on those doors because eventually somebody will be crazy enough to hire us because they'll recognize the passion. So. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's, it's a very um, it's a complicated question. Uh, basically, just because we, we want access. That's it. You know? I am going to uh, reach further, and, and since you guys are listening to me, I'm more upset with, uh, with Latino playwrights that don't give opportunity to Latino directors and Latino actors because they want to go move the next step. You know? I've been in several situations where that, that happens, and, and I totally understand, you know? Uh, but um, when do you cross that line? When do you become an activist? When do you take care of the community? When do you make us grow, and when, when do you not, you know? Um, I do not get upset if somebody, a non-Latino, is, is working on a Latino play, but there has to be a reason. I, I believe that there's a, 
if I have to cast a Latino actor in a, in a Latino role, I'd rather do that because they bring the passion that I don't need to train to get. But I, am, I, I know that all of us in the arts, Latino, non-Latino, we, uh, we have that special sensibility that, and, and train to really be vulnerable. So I think anybody can play any role if you, if you really work on it. But to be honest, it's easier if, you, if you're working on Latino plays. I, I wonder, but I think uh, that's what I would say. Anybody else need to step up? Um, I've had some really wonderful opportunities in directing non Latino plays, and I'm about to direct uh, Lorraine Hans' favorite play, and I'm so excited about that. Um, and I, you know, I think we're, we are storytellers, and we, we want to live and breathe and, you know, taste and smell all different worlds, all kinds of worlds, and um, it's it's a great opportunity to, to live that, to live an Arthur Miller world and a Lorraine Hansberry world. I mean, you know, to just be inside of that reality. And uh, so, yeah. If anybody would like to come into the circle at any time, this is sort of uh, so wearing a, my designer hat, very clearly I think of myself as an interpreter of, um, of uh, writer's words, uh, a visual interpreter of writer's words. And, um, and so as an interpreter, you want to interpret everything, not just the things that are closest and to, to yourself. I think a lot about think a lot about it being like a solar system and, and certainly uh, the plays that speak to my cultural identity or my sexual identity or my uh, place in the world. Um, it feels like I get closer to the sun when I'm uh, designing those plays. Um, and as I move away, I, I love Shakespeare as well, but I do feel like it's more kind of towards Jupiter. <laughs> uh, and so, uh, but I love that I have, that I, that I orbit all of it. Interesting because first you have to say, well, what is a Latino play? Right. You know, and then to me, a Latino play is a play written by a Latino playwright. Period. End of sentence. You know, whatever the content is, uh, it's a play written by a Latino playwright. So that's number one, and I love directing plays by Latino playwrights. But I also think of myself as a director. You know, I didn't kind of set out to say like I'm going to direct plays by women of color. I didn't set out to do that. But those are the plays I'm attracted to. And so, you know, my play, the plays that I've directed, you know, have taken, have been written by Jeff. American writer, Middle Eastern American writer, Armenian Dominican writer, do you know what I mean? I just think, you know, as, a, you, as an artist, you have to go to wherever your heart goes uh, and closer to your, you know, kind of closer to your solar system or further from your solar system. But I think, you know, when I think of myself as a Latina director, I feel like I want a Latino writer to write about whatever the hell they want to write about. Or Latina, yeah, and I wanted the director, as a Latina director, to direct whatever the hell I want to direct. Um, I, when I was getting my, working on my MFA when I was in school, there was all this wonderful stuff that you're exposed to. Of course, none of it was Latino. Um, but you're exposed to all this great stuff, the canon. And it's just so weird to be there and studying and doing it and thinking you're doing such a kick-ass job and having people saying, God, you're really good at that. And then getting out into the real world and only being called in for something that is Latino or, it's just so frustrating and it's really a mind fuck because you, you go, you train, you get all these muscles worked up and then you get out and you don't get to do it. And I, I describe it like, I wanted to be a furniture maker, I'm a craftsman, and I go and I learn how to make these fancy headboards, and then I get out and I'm only allowed to make drawer pulls. Mm -hmm. And it's so, it was so frustrating. But more than any of this, I'm a human being, and a universal story is gonna touch my heart, and it doesn't matter the color. Um, and that's what I'm here to do. And I, I happen to be a Latina and I'm very invested in my culture. But before that, I'm a human being. So let me tell the fucking human being stories. I want to go back to what you were saying about directors. Um, now that I'm getting into the bigger spaces, it's really hard 
to uh, pitch the Latino director. I have come, and there's, only, there's an approved list, you're on that list, <laughs> Lisa's on that list, but my two main collaborators are sitting here, Lori Woolery and Jerry Ruiz, and sometimes they're like, well, they don't have the whatever, you know, what, and I'm like, it, it's, been, it's been a challenge, because I, I only, if it's a Latino play, want to, especially if, I'm talking about the first, the first production, I only want to work with a Latino shorthand, right? You want the shorthand, the cultural shorthand. But it's really difficult. It's not as easy as just like, you don't know what those playwrights have been through, because they, there's a list, you know? And if you don't get those people on the list, they're like, well, just let's get the best person for the job. And sometimes it's not, you know, but I mean, I'm, I'm saying as someone that demands it all the time, but I know that, that these two that I, I've been like, well, what about Jerry Ruiz? And you know, maybe in a few years, I was like, well, I'm gonna keep, <laughs> no, no, I mean, I'm being serious. Like, you know, <laughs> no, like in the big like spaces, but the, I'm not I'm never gonna stop pitching Jerry because that's my dude, you know? So like the same thing with Woolery, like now we're like married uh, um, <laughs> a little bit, right? Um, but, <laughs> but you know, but it's really difficult because there's a list, you know? Uh, anyway, just wanted to say that. It's not, uh, yeah, that, that unfortunately is a reality <laughs> that, that we all face because, you know, th there are levels and, you know, I, I continue to believe that the first question you pose to all of us is, is in a larger sense, we, our responsibility is also to educate some of these people that, that make very stupid offensive statements. It's, it's also once we uh, go into the regional theater system, to really educate some of the artistic directors and some of the people that make the decisions. Um, and, and it's also, I mean, uh, you know, we have people of, of, of Octavio and, 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 and you know, uh, uh, level here, um, and Luis, and, and you know, they can actually go into a regional theater and, and Karen and say, you know, I would like for you to try this or this director. Um, you know, it, it just, Again, we're just beginning to make inroads. It is very difficult because I know the, the regionals view a lot of these questions as financial uh, liabilities, you know, um, and we're having to deal with that. You know, it's just a reality. Uh, but on the other hand, the more of us put pressure, you know, I've started a conversation with the critics in the DC area. They don't know what the fuck they're babbling about half of the time, and now I write them and just say, you know, you have no clue <laughs> what it is that you're talking about. Uh, you know, a couple of years ago, there was a production of Much Ado About Nothing, and the director had a concept that um, it was going to be set in a Cuban sugarcane plantation. Um, and it had absolutely not one Latino actor in it. Um, except, you know, there was a guy named uh, uh, Larry Redman, who happens to be half Cuban, but he just played a very minor role. And, you know, it was just interesting what happened because, um, you know, I had to educate the critics. I mean, they had no clue with that they were actually putting on stage something that was really offensive and pageantry-like, as opposed to really understanding what the sugarcane industry did to the Caribbean islands, you know? So, um, so we just have to continue to fight and educate people so that we never are in a room where we hear people say things like what I was told once, oh, you're Puerto Rican, you're one of the people who like loud music, you know? And that was told to me by somebody who has a PhD, you know, so it's just like, uh, we just need to continue to, to fight and to educate people and to be part of the conversation. Um, I also wanted to talk about two levels in response to this question, two levels um, that I know that I dwell within in terms of the question was uh, the desire to take the helm of Latino themed work and then also wanting to be considered for work outside the Latino experience. And I think that for myself, I find a lot of satisfaction or have done a lot of my work in, in our community. So I'm from San Antonio. So there is no kind of professional theater with lights and sound and we do theater in backyards and um, rehearse in my living room and backyard and all these things. And that's great and we go and we do the plays and, and we do them in, in you know, nooks in the city because we can't find a space in a city of 65% you know, Mexican-Americans, and, and some of our institutions are actually failing us, and I have to say some of that uh, Latino institutions is, is very gendered. Um, we will invite, San Antonio will invite touring artists in before it'll like nurture the people from San Antonio, so there's, there's a big problem there, and so that's the community work, but at the same time, as an artist, like you were speaking about, 
Julia, is that I also have experimentation that I want to do that I don't really, my community doesn't need to go on that journey with me. So like, um, I had a chance to work with Lee Brewer. And it was great because all of a sudden it was like I could experiment and play and there's that level too, which I find more is about um, the, my own professionalism and the fact that, that sure, I want to try out different aesthetics and, I, and I'm capable of doing that. And I'm also a person who is bicultural versus some artists who never have to kind of dipping into, well, let me learn about Latino culture before I direct this play. It's like I live in these worlds. I live in an African-American world, I live in a Latino world, I live in a, a white world. So there's not, the translation for me has been my whole life. Bilingual, bicultural, you know, looking at my whole life this way. So um, of course I know Shakespeare. I've met him since I was a child in grade school. Have you met my Latino playwrights? Oh no, I just picked up that play, you know, a couple weeks ago. And it's like that's where I start to become very discomfited by someone touring in in my culture and my cultural world. So I just wanted to enunciate those two levels between professional and then kind of the community work or different kind of modes of making for theater. Uh, it, well, I'm Jose Luis in Valenzuela, and I. Uh, I directed in the regional theaters many years ago. It's not necessarily the greatest thing in the world. <laughs> <laughs> because I, I, I'm listening like the aim is how can we get hired to be at these theaters. Mm -hmm. And it, I, I feel kind of strange because I left regional theaters in 95. Huh. Because I didn't feel that the art working was better necessarily. You know what I mean? So I, I like the conversation to figure out, are we talking about the work? Are we talking about surviving and getting money and, or becoming famous or something like that? You know, I, I made my career in Europe more than in the United States. And it's so rewarding. You really want to direct and work really as an artist, find yourself in European theaters or Latin American theaters and do really great work. Now you want to make money and survive, you know. But, but I think the conversation should be different. Because we try to get ourselves in a list or be part of the club to do better work or just to be something. I think that's, that's important for these conversations that we are having. <coughs> you know, which is not a conversation here about, you know, I wanted it to be about work but understand that we're trying to assess the field. <coughs> but, but I still wanna do a reality check. Regional theaters are not the best work in the country. And it's interesting to me because we're talking about Latino theater is not as good right now in the United States. American theater is in a crisis in general. Right. Mm -hmm. And we have to include ourselves as part of that crisis, you know? If artistically what you have to aim is what we see in regional theaters, we don't trust. So I do the same. Hi, I'm Enrique Urueta, a playwright. Um, I felt compelled to take a seat because of what what you said, Danielle. And this isn't uh, this isn't a, a rebuttal or a challenge. And I just I just want to clarify up front that this isn't about you or any one person or any one director or, or anything, but I think it goes a little bit both ways in the sense that uh, when I was starting out, I, was, uh, I reached out to uh, Latino theater artists in the field and was completely shut down uh, by, uh, and, 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 felt, and felt completely shut down by a lot of people because they were, they were like, oh, well, you're not in my circle. You're not my, like I have my people that I work with, or or mm, or uh, there was this like the standoff, this standoffishness, and so it forced me to just find the people that that were willing to be, to believe in me, and so I feel and like I had this, and then I, w I was taking a look at at the people who were there who, who they were working with, and and um, I had this I had this sense of like oh. I bet if I go to a fancy school and get a fancy MFA, uh, 
that that these people that some of these people will will suddenly take an interest in me. And so I went to Brown, and then that happened. And then it was like, oh, um, I bet if I get the, and, oh, oh, if I leave San Francisco and get this national award, then people will start taking me seriously as an artist, as a, as opposed to just a San Francisco artist. And so I took this drum fellowship. And then, and then like all, all of these things uh, proved to become true. And I, uh, and I don't, I'm, and I'm not saying this as an attack on any one person or anyone, but there are, there are people in, in, there are people present in this room who, who, who I felt like sh shut me out. And, but it also like gave me the courage to like, to, to, to push forward and, and, work, and work even harder. So, um, and I also have to thank Karen because Karen uh, was the first person outside of San Francisco that took the time, like the first person. It was huge. Uh, I, I applied for, a, this, uh, I think it was a drum fellowship back in 2005 and you were on the committee and you took the time after, after everything to just say, I really love your work and I really believe in your work. And that meant so much to me that there was someone, not, not just like in the field nationally, but a Latino in the, in the field nationally, who, who like took the time to say that when I, had tr when I tried to like reach out and seek that out beforehand. Um, so ultimately what this is getting at is, I, I feel like we need to find a way to build, uh, build back up this, this, this mentor, this, this mentorship and this, this, and this embracing of the next generation as opposed to, well, I've already gotten here. Um, when you get here, we'll talk, if that makes any sort of sense. Thank you. Uh, my name's Elisa Marina Alvarado. I'm the Artistic Director of Teatro Vision. And um, I've been listening to our discussion of, um, of our work and, and the knocking and the knocking and the knocking on the doors of the regional theaters. And I, and I can't help but feel like there's this lusting after the regional <laughs> theater companies. And I, I just ask for an acknowledgement of the Latino theater companies that for you know, uh, many, many years have been fully committed to doing your work. Um, <laughs> professional main stage, you know, quality uh, work and, you know, that it's been our companies that have done the world premieres of, of many of the plays and with all the production values and, um, and you know, wonderful uh, uh, professional, you know, AEA cast and so, um, you know, I just want you to also put in your, in your you know, your eyesight, uh, you know, our companies that are also have been there for you and will continue to be there for you. Thank you. Sorry, I hopped back in. Um, but it was off of Jose Luis Valenzuela and actually off of what you just said. I mean, that, but the reality is, is that, you know, I know what uh, Lord SDC contract pays me. You know what I mean? And there is a reality of money for every actor, for every designer, for every director, for every writer. I know the commissions I'm married to a play, right? I know the, the difference in the commissioning funding. And that doesn't mean we need to lust after the regional theaters. It goes back to Olga's point, which is that we have to raise more money for our theaters to fund us at the level that we need to be funded to make the rest of life. Um, so okay, and then I have a big question. Sorry, guys. Um, just, does the playwrights to continue to navigate. Look, Campo Santo is a storefront theater uh, in, a, in a borrowed space, the ACT costume department, you know. Um, to, na to be able to go there and, 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 sh and by the way, Sean San Jose directing The River, you know, was an accomplishment. And then, um, um, just two things. One, it's not a lust for the regional theater, but I, you know, I, I have to tell you that for American Night to be the first out of the American Revolution cycle at OSF was a big risk for um, Bill and Chris and OSF, and, and, and I, need, I needed that gig um, as a writer. It started out as a culture clash gig, but I, I, took, I had to take it because 
I wasn't seen as, as collectively uh, being able to meet the demands of the deadline, so I just, I just kind of ran with it. Um, and, and so, you know, I, I, I know when, or I'm hoping that, that we'll go back and, and, and cross the street many, many times. And, and something at the regionals too, and I'm not the apologist, I'm not. I'm looking, I'm getting gigs where I can. But it, we talk about the aesthetic, but we, you know, there are resources you know, at, the, at the regionals. And I don't know if that elevates our aesthetic or not, but you're gonna get a much different show. And, 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 and sometimes the stripped down storefront version is, you know, you see God again, you know, you, you, you have the baptism. On, on the frustration I hear about directors, you know, I often look at a director if it's a gay or lesbian director, are they planting the flag you know, in, in, in that direction? And for me, Elisa Peterson is a strong uh, woman um, director who plants many flags and she challenges the hell out of Culture Clash. They can be a boys club at times. And she's that fourth member uh, when we're lucky enough to work with her and, and she's the woman in the group at that time. And um, same goes with Taconi and I know these are, you know, these aren't exactly Gomez and Sanchez, but, but, but you know, Sean San Jose and, and, and just looking for the future to collaborate and as a strategy, how do we strengthen ourselves? So Diane Rodriguez is directing our next show and Diane and I have gone down that road, sometimes with success, sometimes not, but you know, she has to direct this play there. Well, guess what? We're not doing your play. You know, and Diane is more, she's beyond capable of directing, so that list, and fighting for each other and strategizing. But if you can get Bill Rausch to direct your play, Peace at the Getty Villa, I, I say do it. But you also have to at the same time make the fight for some of the directors in this room. Um, we're also talking about visibility here. We're talking about infiltrating the mainstream. So, um, Although, yes, I agree that, that sometimes regional theater can, you, you, you can start making choices that have to do with uh, pleasing, pleasing, pleasing the administration or pleasing the audiences and can diminish the quality of the work. Um, in the end, really, we want to be seen and heard on some level, and it's the beginning of something, you know? and, and I think, you know, as someone who's had the opportunity to work in a lot of regional theaters, you know, it's, I, I've been given some incredible opportunities that have allowed me to take risks on, s on each production. I take a bigger risk, 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 and it's allowed me to grow. And I, I, I don't feel at this point that I'm compromising at all by working in the regional theater. And I feel like I, I feel like, uh, well, I, I, I feel honored to represent the community, you know? You know, in, in directing on the right hands break play, I feel honored to represent the community. And uh, I'd love to do more Teatro Vistas. It also is a financial issue for me. I mean, I'm barely <laughs> surviving as, as, a, as a regional theater director and I'm a member of Cornerstone. Um, you know, and that's like giving me juice too. Uh, but uh, um, you know, I, it is a financial issue. Also, you know, it's like how how do we how do we raise the money? How, I don't know. I don't know. I'm Mike Espinosa. I'm an educator, and the visibility is important because most of the time when I meet my 18-year-old Latino student, Latina student. They, they, they see it, they're really smart. And they see how Latino theater is marginalized in the academy, mm -hmm. how it's marginalized financially, professionally, and they want to belie their roots. They want to somehow be so far away from themselves. Um, it breaks my heart. Um, I'm glad that you brought up uh, the, the Academy. Uh, I wonder earlier when we were saying about American theater um, 
is in crisis the way we also teach American theater is in a little bit more crisis than we have to uh, um, <coughs> perhaps learn how to teach it in a different way and there's some resistance there. Um, I, I, I will say that uh, because I have been involved in new play development for many years, um, I wonder how, and I find myself kind of waiting, waiting for these spaces to be available where you can actually take a bit of a larger risk, uh, take a little bit of a longer time to, to explore and shape a piece. Um, uh, I, just, I just wonder and I'm waiting to see where, and I don't know, this is not one of those moments that I don't know where the space um, uh, is going to be. I happen to be in the play selection committee for my department of theater, uh, and it's incredibly difficult. I got a little uh, lecture the other day um, about not putting forth certain Latino plays, right? Um, a, but I wonder, I wonder where that space is and where we can find it and how we can support it. I, I don't know, and maybe Chris can speak to this. Um, I know, for example, that when I'm in, uh, working on a new play develop, uh, a new play with my colleagues, Latinos or not, um, eh, but a Latino play. Um, eh, for example, and I know Candido's here and Matt is here. Uh, <coughs> I, I personally, I am a mess. You know, my studio is just full of papers. I seal the layers. There's some drinking involved. Uh, you know, I need to get to to the bottom of it, and I, I want to unload it. I want to be prepared, and, and I want to be informed. And uh, I see those opportunities to be a mess and be crazy and silly, and uh, and have the courage to take those bigger risks, kind of shrinking. Um, and. Uh, I need it, I need it for my growth, I need it for, because that's why I'm in theater in the first place. I don't know, we, any we thoughts about, about that? We have about 10 minutes left. Um, so one of the questions I'm gonna ask is, you may go back to another one, but I'm just gonna put that out there so you can, think, so you can be thinking about it, is um, what is your dream project? Because I think saying it out loud in this room with all these people, I don't know, maybe something magical will happen. <laughs> so, um, as you're answering and thinking these last 10 minutes, as we're talking about how can we make, because the interest of the Latino Theater Commons is always how can we make the future brighter. Mm -hmm. um, think about that. There's this project, of, maybe you're working on it already, maybe it's a, a thought in your head, but this is the moment to let the universe know. And we can always go back to any other question that was brought up. Uh, just in terms of uh, making the future brighter, uh, and it's, it's supporting the, the young generation of, of actors, Latino actors and Latino directors via small theater companies like, like Inter, uh, which I, I'm an artistic associate from. And, and uh, we basically found uh, there was a need for us to populate the, play, the plays of our mission, of our playwrights, no? so we wanted to, to train these people to get to know you guys. Um, and then uh, there's an interest of young directors working with the young act Latino actors so they can know the community. And all of a sudden the world went out and we have like seven female Latina directors that are interested in working with us. And uh, I don't know where we, everybody's volunteering, everybody's doing it for the love. Uh, and um, so that's where we're, that's where we're getting the opportunity for our artists, not necessarily in the big, training academies or Creative regional themes. theaters. Yeah, we have to create them ourselves. Uh, uh, my big dream uh, is, um, uh, I've had this idea of starting a, a theater ashram. Um, and I actually think this is kind of happening in places like, uh, like I guess a, a 101, right? Where you have this space uh, uh, where people you have like the monks, right? These are the practitioners, right? That are offering, like there's an ashram uh, in the mission where I used to work by Gavira Rasa, right? There's like yoga classes, meditation classes for young and old. Where, so you're offering these different, these different uh, classes in the, in the arts, right? The, the arts of conjuring, right? Like of, of using our voices to cast the spells and of uh, spectacle, of, of, of puppeteering and, uh, and acrobatics and uh, for, for old and young, and then that uh, these, these 
people, these sort of stewards of this, uh, go out like the monks would go out and, uh, and preach or beg or whatever for alms. Like, you go out in the street and you do the street theater, you do the ceremonia slash theater, dance, uh, prayer, uh, Throughout the you know throughout the the, the week and the, and the special times in the year the solstices and the those those special times that you note then then you have the, the the more skilled people and the and the, the community folks that are taking the class and you do these bigger bigger events these I had this idea for a festival of Dionysus it, you call it festival of Quetzalcoatl where you're gonna commission three tragedies very a la Luis Alfaro uh, you know about the barrio tragedies that happened. Um, and just uh, and then also visiting mystics, right? Just come in from other ashrams, from other places, and stay there and live there for a while, and then share their their skills and their expertise. Mark, so that's do it. Yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> just uh, just very quickly, I'm just reflecting on. Uh, I have, uh, this is more of a statement. Just reflecting on the expansiveness of the conversation, like the voices, the 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 value of wanting to aspire to be a director that works internationally or aspire to work in a regional theater or aspire to create street theater that all of it has great value and we are uh, we are this amazing diverse group of people that can have the, all of that yeah um, I have the privilege actually of being uh, one of the oldest participants here. <laughs> so I, I have uh, perhaps the advantage of perspective. And the first time a Teatro Gambesino made it in New York was in 1967. We were in the Village Gate, one performance, one night, 2,000 people, 500 striking uh, social workers in the balcony. But it, uh, Village Gate had been the only Yiddish theater in New York, in, in, the, in the village. And that was a wonderful uh, experience. Uh, I went back years later with Zutsu uh, to Winter Garden. Uh, I think that the truth about Zutsu in 1979 is that we were 30 years too soon. Mm -hmm. But we broke the ice. With our heads, but we broke the ice. You know? <laughs> You know, again, we all have roles to play, and um, uh, my mother used to call me Labre Caminos, you know, Yamada. I don't know if you know the Sete Potencias Africanas. But, uh, you know, some people have to open roads and paths. And another road that recently opened up for me, and I have to open up, we hear a lot of talk about Latino here, and, uh, and I don't think that we're entirely clear yet on, on that theme. Uh, it's much too vague, much too general to be ultimately of any use to anybody. First and foremost, it's an adjective, but we're using it as a noun. <coughs> Latino, Hispanic, those are adjectives. The noun is American. American, okay? We're in New England. No one talks about New Spain anymore. But New Spain was a hell of a lot bigger than New England. And what we're seeing now is the merger of New Spain and New England. And these are the so-called Latinos. Now, we invite Anglos to come and join the mix. There's no one keeping people from becoming Latino. <laughs> <laughs> Latinos, by their nature, have to become Anglo. I'm not speaking in Puedo hablar español. I don't know if you see. Puedo hablar español, uh, porque soy latino, but I'm also bilingual, so I speak English. But one of the bilingual experiences that I had is I went in the other direction a couple of years ago. Uh, thanks to Alma Martinez, uh, I was invited to direct uh, the Spanish world premiere of Zoot Suit in Mexico City. And that was an astounding experience for me. Now, I was not the first Chicano Latino playwright to be translated, to be performed. Oliver Meyer, Blade to the Heat, you know. Carlos Morton, you know, had, had stuff done. But I was the first one to be produced by the National Theater of Mexico, Teatro Nacional, en Español, entre Chilangos, you know. <laughs> and my, my baptism was to go there as the Chicano, as an ex you know. 
ex ex butcher, <laughs> and and to direct uh, my play in in the Mera Capirucha man in, in the Epe, and to teach Mexicanos how to be Chicano. <laughs> that was interesting, you know. They took they they they, they have this. They have a, a system, we have 60 days to rehearse. It was wonderful. Mm -hmm. Lupe and I were in Coyoacan for 60 days, you know, five minutes away from the Compañía's headquarters. And, and, and it was a wonderful process, and, and, and they were very receptive, and, and, and I didn't know what the audience was going to do. They kept saying, don't expect that late, don't expect that late. People are much more reserved here. And so I went into it, you know, a professional top-notch designers, built costumes from the ground up, Neon signs coming in. I mean, they, they spent some bucks on this, some pesos, you know what I mean? And you know what? I got paid! <laughs> <laughs> I went in the opposite direction. I got paid royalties, and I got paid for directing. I was almost ashamed. I went to... <laughs> I went mean, across the desert, you know, I went, I flew in. To <laughs> and and I, I was paid for the privilege, you know? Equal the campesinos that came over a, a hundred years ago, right? In the opposite, we're going to a norte. But there I'm back in Mexico, and and uh, and the thing is that it was a wonderful experience, and and it verified everything. They they love Zoot Suit. It's been produced, it's still in rep. You know, they, they they took it to Colombia of all places. They took it to Juarez. They took it to Guanajuato. They, they you know, and they revived it this year, uh, uh, back in in Mexico, and it's very popular. Mexicanos love it. Which proves that what we have to say about ourselves here can play across the border, can play in America Latina, okay? And so that speaks to the future. And I, I suggest to you who, who are playwrights, think of your work in terms of the international scope. Get translated into Spanish, they will do you there. You know? It isn't just a question of, of relating to the United States. It's a question of relating to America. America. So we're going to take a 15 minute break. We need everybody back in the room by 2.50. 2.50, you have a 15 minute break. Thank <laughs> you. 